a simplify g to the power 8 divided by g to the power 2 so first things first when you divide terms you subtract the power so it'll be 8 minus 2 is going to be g to the power 6 okay b simplify 6 e squared m7 times 3 e m to the power 4 now you just take this term term by term when you multiply you add the powers but as for the whole numbers you just hit it head on so 6 times 3 is 18 e squared times e, you add the power, so it's like 2 plus 1 is e3. m to the power 7 times n to the power 4, again, you add the powers, so it'd be 7 plus 4, which is 11. So m to the power 11. Yep, that's done. C, simplify all of these lot to the power of half. Now, that's not too bad. When you, ha when, you, when you have everything to the power of half or anything to the power of something, you distribute this power to all the terms. So it's going to be 64 to the power of a half. And then a6, stick a half next to it. And then c2, and stick a half next to it. And now you just expand it. So 64 to the power of half, you can smash in your calculator and you'll get 8. That's basically the square root of 64. 6 times a half is 3, so 8 to the power of 3. And then 2 times a half is 1, so c to the power of 1, or just c. Okay, good. So that's done too. Now d, x, factorize x squared minus 1. So when you see an example like this, this is known as an, because you can't factorize this the standard way because there's nothing in common. So this is an example of dos, which is difference of two squares. Okay, you have a square term minus another square term. And when you get that, you get instantly a double bracket solution. So this is important to know. Now what goes in both of them? Well, you need two terms that's, that are times to make x, uh, x squared. Or if you square root, you get x and x. And if you square root 1, you get 1. So the solution would be x plus 1 and x minus 1. It's always going to be plus or minus, and the terms are going to be the same. All right, E now. Make k the subject of this function, where f equals the square root of 1 minus 2k over 3. Now, first things first, before we even do anything, let's clear that square root to make it look a bit better. So if you, if you to clear the square root, we need to do the opposite, which is squaring so square both sides you get f squared equals 1 minus 2k over 3 so the square and square root cancels out now next step you want to do is clear the fraction so multiply 3 across so you get 3f squared equals 1 minus 2k now we're almost done you can see that we, this is not too bad to do now i like to make my my subject terms positive so i'm going to plus 2k 2k across and minus 3f squared across so you get plus 2k equals 1 minus 3f squared. And lastly, to separate the 2 from the k, just divide everything by 2. So you're going to get k equals 1 minus 3f squared over 2. And that's your answer, guys. Okay? Alright, number 16. So the diagram shows triangle P, Q, R. Okay? So it looks like we have a small triangle and we have pretty much an identical identical similar triangle which has been expanded now let's have a read a is a point on pr which is here and b is a point on qr over here so that a b this line is parallel to this line pq all right good so we're given some measurements which is also here work out the length of ap so we need to work out this little length here now there's a nice trick here the way, the way these kind of triangles work is that these are known as similar triangles, okay? So we have a small triangle here and a massive triangle there. And it helps to re-sketch the diagram. So you've got a small triangle here and you've got the similar sized one over here. Where you've got six at the bottom and you've got five on the left. But then you also have 15 at the bottom and then you want to find some length on the left or part of it. Now the trick is, because it's similar, we need to find the common scale scale factor yeah and to find the scale factor pick two common lengths like 15 and 6 and then divide them so in your calculator you're going to write 15 divided by 6 to find the scale factor of 2.5 so this tells us that all the lengths from these two triangles have been multiplied by 2.5 so therefore if you want to find this length here which is part of ap you just do 5 times 2.5 and if you do that you're going to get 12.5 here now that's the length of the full thing from R to P, yeah? We know part of it is 5. I know it looks kind of weird, but this length is actually longer than it should be. The total length is going to be 12.5, so subtract it from 5 to get the remainder, which will give us 
7.5 okay and that's it the level of ap is 7.5 now next bit given that the area of the triangle pqr so pqr is basically pqr is the whole shape so the big shape has an area of 88 centimeters squared work out the area of arb in other words the small triangle now again this is this is also to do the scale factor now one thing you want to be careful with is is to not divide 88 by 2.5 this is a scale factor of a length you need to find a scale factor of an area which is the scale factor squared if you had volumes as well it'll be scale factor cubed which would be 2.5 cubed so in your calculator you're going to put 88 divided by 2.5 cubed and when you do that um you should get to you should get a full answer of let's see 14.08 and yeah that's it so use algebra to show that the recurring decimal over here equals this fraction now to prove anything and when they say use algebra they literally tell us all right we need to always let this equation equal something like x so x equals 0 0.0 zero two four recurring but instead of just writing recurring i'm going to just actually recur it okay just a bit so i'm just going to show you a demonstration and that should hopefully help so i'm multiplying this by 10 like powers of 10 you're going to get this move in one place so it'll be 0 0.242424 and so on and the key idea is to keep multiplying by 10 until all the numbers line up in the same position so for example if i times it by 10 again i get 100x and then times this by 10, you get 2.4242424, so on. Now, one thing to note, we look at we look at all three equations and we ask ourselves, okay, so where do the numbers line up anywhere? And yes, they do. They line up over here. You can see we've got 2.4 in the second and third decimal place and 2.4 here. And again, they're, they're the same for the rest. Unfortunately for this one, they're not lined up properly because 2 doesn't line up with 4 at all. It, it doesn't line up with the right numbers. So we take the 100x bit and the x bit so we and we subtract um, both equations here so we say all right 100x take with x is 99x and then more in subtracting these long extended decimal you'll realize that all of these will cancel out if you subtract from each other and all you're left with is um 2.4 take away zero which is 2.4 yeah we're pretty much done here and then you just solve for x by dividing 99 so x equals 2.4 over 99 and just to be sure we're right put down your calculator and then you should get an answer of exactly 4 over 165 so that's really it all right number 18 so we have three different vectors and if you're not sure how the vectors are represented the top number represents the x values moving horizontally like across and the bottom values represent the y axis so going upwards so this a would tell us that we've got a vector that's positioned five to the left and six up from the origin now let's just look at the, what the question wants so a write two times b minus c as a column vector so literally just multiply this vector b by two and then subtract from c and then combine it so times in the first vector by two you get six and four and we're going to minus it from vector c so four minus two and now this is just like normal subtraction but in this case you subtract across so be careful you don't do it like fractions there is no common denominators here there is no denominators even so subtracting vectors would be six take away four which is two and then four minus minus two so four plus two is six and that's what they want okay cho says that the vector a minus b so subtracting these two is parallel to vector c is cho correct now, to show something is parallel, you literally need to show that a, a vector is proportional to another vector. In other words, it's like a, it's just the same thing but multiplied by two or three. But let's have a look. Let's go, let's subtract a. Just do a minus b and see what it looks like. Yeah. So we got. Let's write it down here. So we got minus five and six, minus the b vector which is three two. If you subtract them, so minus five take away three is minus eight. Six take away two is four now looking at vector c we've got four minus two so c is four minus two now looking at both of this you can kind of see that this vector here a minus b is sort of double but not exactly double it's a negative double so we can rewrite this as minus two times four negative two
So to properly answer this question, is Cho correct? Yes. Reason being is that A minus B is minus 2 times bigger than C. And they're both moving in the same direction of 4 and minus 2. Alright, express this fraction, both of them, as a single fraction. Give your answer as simply as possible. Now one thing you have to notice is that we are subtracting two different fractions. So the first rule is when you add or subtract is to get common denominators, yeah? Now to make them common, we just need to stick what they don't have. So the first one does not have an x plus 5 and the second bit don't have, don't have an 2x plus 1. So that's what you're going to do. You're going to times the left side all by x plus 5, up and down. And you times the right side by 2x plus 1, up and down. Let's do that, yeah? So times it up and down by x plus 5. 1 times the x plus 5 is just x plus 5 over and then just stick x plus 5 times 2x plus 1 together. And now the second fraction, again, uh, is going to have a, the same common denominator, so x plus 5 and 2x plus 1. You're going to times up, you're going to times the top also by 2x plus 1. So it'll be 3 times 2x plus 1, which is 6x plus 3. Okay, now, we're now almost done here. So now we just combine it. Now, because you're subtracting, you just literally subtract terms. So it'll be x take away 5x, which is minus 5x. And 5 take away 3 is 2. So it'll be minus 5x plus 2. But I'm going to put 2 in front because it looks better that way. And all of this over x plus 5 and 2x plus 1. Now, just to make it clear, you literally do not have to, what's it called? Um, expand the bottom half of the fraction. You could leave it like this and you should be good. All right, part B. Solve the inequality 6 times x minus 1 squared greater than 24. All right, to do something like this, literally forget your dealing with inequalities. Just treat it like an equal sign for the time being. So rewriting this, we're going to have 6 times x minus 1 squared equals 24. And now we're going to go ahead and simplify this quickly, yeah? So we're going to firstly divide 6 across. We're not going to bother expanding this, yeah? So you get x minus 1 squared. Divide this by 6, you're going to get 4. And now to get rid of the, the square, we need to square root both sides. So you're left with x minus 1 equals the square root of 4, which is 2. But because you square root, it will be plus minus 2. Now lastly, we're going to add 1 across. So we're going to have x equals plus minus 2 add 1. Which is what we're trying to say here is that if you chose the plus version, you're going to have plus 2 plus 1, which is 3. Or if you start with minus 2, you have minus 2 add 1, which is minus 1. Okay, so you have two solutions of x. Now, this is not the answer they, they're looking for. They're looking for inequality values. Now, the point of this, this is known as our critical values here. And using our critical values, we're going to construct a little table like this. Put this in ascending order, so minus 1 and 3. And we're going to test an x value between it to see where it's true, where the inequality is true. And I'm going to show you this method so you can use it in the exam. So let's pick a value between minus 1 and 3. Let's say 0 because 0 is always, always good. So when x equals 0, you plug into the original equation. So you're going to have uh, 6 times 0 minus 1, um, all squared. So it'll be 0 minus 1 squared. And what does that give us? We're going to check if it's bigger than 24. Well, 0 minus 1 is minus 1. Square you get 1, you, you get 6. And of course, this isn't bigger than 24. So this side is false. So what this tells us is that the inequality is not between minus 1 and 3. It's away. If this side is false, this is auto automatically going to be true. And therefore, you're going to have x values which are less than minus 1, which fits this side. Or x values which is greater than 3. So these are your results. Okay, and that's it guys, yeah? If you have any questions about this, let me know in the comment section, yeah? Okay, number 20. So we've got A, B and C are points on the circle. So we've got A, B and C with center O. So this means these lines up next to it are the radiuses so a radius here and a radius there now tap is a tangent to the circle so here's tap now when you have a tangent this is literally important always connect a line from the tangent to the center circle because immediately we're going to have a right angle triangle on both sides or right angles from it so this is a default reason yeah now TBOC is a straight line, so this is also important. So you've got T to B to O to C. And angle ACT is 29 degrees. So the aim is to find the value of exit and give a reason for each step. 
Okay, so I'm going to just give the reason verbally, yeah? and I'll try to write some of it down. So the first thing you want to do is firstly um, notice that we can form a triangle from ABC, and that's very important too. So I'm going to just use a blue pen. So here's triangle ABC. Now the significance of this is that when you have a semicircle, when you have, when you have a, a line cutting straight across a diameter, you can, you can see that this cuts off half the semicircle or half the circle. So when you have a semicircle, the angle opposite the semicircle is always right angled here. So we have a right angle triangle inside a semicircle. So we can write that down. Semicircle, therefore angle CAB is 90 degrees, it's right angled. So this is one property. So if this is 90 degrees, you can easily work out this angle here, which is going to be 90 plus 21 and minus it from 180 will give us 61 degrees. So all of this must sum up to 180. So triangle um, A, B, C um, adds up to 180 degrees. So it's good to just put these points down. Now another thing to note here, yeah, and this is probably more of the, the tougher theorems here. Yeah? Let me just delete this for a second, yeah, these little red marks. Now um, there's something known as the alternate segment theorem. So this is quite important, alternate segment theorem. Now you always have, you always get this when you have a tangent and a chord. And what that tells us is that the angle between the tangent of course is equal to the angle opposite the chord, which is over here, which is 61. So this angle is 61 by default, yeah? So we say therefore angle PAC is 61 degrees, which is equal to angle, what was I said? ABC. So this is the alternate segment theorem, yeah? So the angle from between the tangent and the chord is equal to the angle on the other side of the chord, which is at point B. Okay, so that's the reason why that's helpful is because when you get that, and because we already know, we already established that this is 90 degrees, we can work at the angle on the other side. And we know that the angle on a straight line adds up to 180. So basically I'm saying all the way across. So you've got 61 here, you've got 90 here. And if you add these up and subtract it from uh, 180, well, you'll get 29 as well. So that's that's another one. Now the last one, and you'll probably see this now, in order to get X, we need, we're gonna deal with this last triangle here, ATB. Now, another good thing is, is that we already know that at point B, we've got 61 degrees. So if we wanna work out this angle here, this is the angle across a straight line, yeah? So let's minus 180 from 61. So you do that, you're gonna get 119 degrees. So almost done. So now we have a triangle of 29, 119 and X. And all angles in a triangle must add up to 180. So let's add 29 to it and then minus it from 180. You should get a remainder of 32 degrees. And that's it guys, your X is 32 degrees. Mm -hmm.